Okay. We're online? Great. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us again today. Dean and Aisha here. Today, we're going to talk about a very exciting case, and I'm not quite sure if some of you have already seen the picture that we attached to the invite for this talk, but it's a picture of a brain of an individual who uh, was having some headaches, mild headaches, and he sought medical help, uh, went to the doctor, find out what's going on to see if he could get some medication. Um, initially, you know, they really didn't make a big deal about it, but after some time, they did some imaging of the brain, and what they found out was just incredibly interesting. The guy had loss of about 80 to 90 percent of his brain substance, and mm -hmm. so what was left out was just a very thin rim of brain matter in in his uh, in his skull and the rest was cerebral spinal fluid and the rest was just fluid and obviously <clears throat> this does, did did not happen overnight it Correct. must have been a process that took you know long long time years for it to happen and the headache was not associated incidental. with it so it was an incidental finding but the interesting thing is the gentleman was cognitively intact had a normal life had an wife IQ, and children. Wife and children had an IQ of about 89, 90, yeah. and didn't seem to have any problem at all. And you know, we always equate brain substance with functionality, but that's not the case. And Dean, you had a patient similar yeah. to this, didn't you? Absolutely. I had a young lady who came to me in her mid thirties, <clears throat> who had same thing: headaches, some visual changes. Uh, we treated her, evaluated her, then got an MRI, and the MRI showed basically an inch of brain tissue. The rest was space ventricles. The, the ventricles are the spaces within the brain. Usually they're fairly small, and this is the two hemispheres of the brain, right hemisphere, left, left hemisphere. And then the inside is the uh, lateral ventricle and third ventricle, and then it goes down the spinal, uh, the brain stem, small uh, groove, and then into the spine. It's fluid that actually rotates around the brain. It coats the brain. Mm -hmm. It's protective, it has chemicals in there, but it's a small space. Yeah. But in some people, and children, hydrocephalus it's called, where the pressure builds up and, and pushes the brain out. Mm -hmm. If it happens rapidly, the person dies because the brain stem, which is the area of the brain that keeps you alive, gets pressured and dies. Mm -hmm. But uh, if it happens over slowly over decades, uh, people don't notice it. <clears throat> and in this lady, she had a, significantly enlarged ventricle yes. and lots of loss of brain tissue mm -hmm. but guess what she had done with this brain well, obviously this happened from childhood on she was a professor summa cum laude uh, of psychology teaching uh, uh, students and had above average uh, function yeah. with that brain so what does that tell you uh, is is brain volume important in general terms brain volume is important right. But more than brain volume, it's connectivity and resilience. That's Absolutely. important. And that's the topic of today's discussion, brain resilience yeah. uh, or, or cognitive resilience. So what is it? What is the term uh, cognitive resilience or brain resilience mean? Yeah, the, there are two concepts that you spoke about yes. beautifully today in the conference. One is brain reserve. The other is cognitive reserve. Brain reserve is the part of the brain function that, that's left after a certain age. Some people say five years of age, six, it doesn't matter, it's early on. <clears throat> it's the amount of neurons that are built. Mm -hmm. We get, we actually at age three, we have way more neurons than ever after. It's at that stage that a process called apoptosis, programmed cell death, takes place. A lot of neurons die and the structure that's left behind is your brain structure. Right. But more than 90% of your brain structure is already there and cells are there. And then you grow and then the final product around that age, five, six, is your brain and the connectivity, the pattern, the con all these things are determined. That's brain reserve. Whatever IQ, whatever cognitive function you have, that's, the, that's determined both by your genetics and by your environment. That's what, where we are actually very adamant of the fact that you, what, what happens to you as a prenatal in, in, in mother's womb and also in the first few years does matter. Mm -hmm. It's not just genetics. And there's a lot you can do to affect that. Absolutely. And then from then on, the connectivity that takes place and myelination, which is the coding of the nerves that takes place for up to age 25 and beyond, Absolutely. is 
cognitive reserve. Yeah. And those two factors are important. The first one, as a person, you have nothing to do with. No, not really. It's your parents, parents' genes and what they did. Yeah. The second component, which is the connectivity, is what you have significant control over. In fact, we keep talking about nutrition and exercise and everything else, but the most protective factor for brain health seems to be cognitive reserve and disconnectivity. And all of those factors, whether it's diet, exercise, keeping your mind active, um, helps build that connectivity. It creates that environment where the brain cells and the connective tissue thrive and exactly. have the ability to make connections. And a very simple example, which I loved, if this was yours, but I will use it, is you know when you're deciding or when you're planning on going up a mountain, Yeah. you want to go there prepared and you don't go there with just one set of rope. You go there with multiple set of ropes just in case, making sure that you don't fall, you, have, you don't have any circumstances that would put you in harm's way. But if you have a lot of tools and if you have a lot of ropes, the chances of you falling is Correct. Right. I mean, you're connected to the top by one rope and if it's severed, you're gone. Or by a thousand ropes. Exactly. That, that one is mine. I, I thought that, yeah, that this is... This, it this, is. Yeah, this is actually incredibly... Um, uh, important concept that you uh, brought up uh, when it came to stroke. Um, the idea of resilience actually came from Aisha's work on stroke that, that showed that even post-stroke, yes. there is protection. Absolutely. That, that, that's amazing. Uh, so why is this important? It's because it gives you hope. Yeah. The work we do is not about, uh, some people have asked us, is, are you blaming the person that got a stroke? Are you blaming the person? No, it's about taking control of your most important organ the brain, this little organ. Um, this, uh, this brain, we have significant control over it, and one of the elements is cognitive reserve. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and uh, we, we actually have evidence from different populations. Um, cognitive reserve has actually been measured uh, with imaging, yes. with neuropsychological testing, the nurses help uh, the no I'm sorry the nun study the nun study yes the a nun fun study, study yeah which is a phenomenal study and I think there are a couple of books about the nun study too so for some of you who are interested about the concept of cognitive reserve go ahead and do some research on and it. we alluded to it in our book as well and we've described that in our book um, so so the nuns were um, a group of um, of course nuns in Minnesota I believe yeah. that was the state in North, yeah. where they dedicated themselves their lives and at the end of their life their brain for autopsy to understand the concept of uh, cognitive reserve and they found that among, among nuns who were cognitively active and who had a very active social life and they had a high vocabulary um, they had no signs and symptoms of cognitive impairment later on Correct. in life Correct. and when their brains were autopsied and biopsied. They actually had the pathology of Alzheimer's disease Correct. and dementia, yet none of it was seen during their life. Yeah. And so the concept of brain reserve and cognitive reserve actually emanated from that. Yeah, and then the uh, taxi study came from that, that <clears throat> men in their 50s in, in, in London who actually uh, challenged themselves because they had to take this very hard test at the time. There was no uh, uh, Google Maps and things of that nature <laughs> that they had. Are you they, trying to say Google Maps are, are making us easy, uh, lazy? It is in a way. Yeah. It is actually yes. Uh, but but it's what happens that these people in their fifties actually grow. They did the imaging and they grew their brain, mm -hmm. especially their hippocampus, the memory center parts of the yes, brain. Yes, the two they, areas. Uh, where are they specifically? Right here. Yeah. Exactly. So right here. Yeah. So that's why it's it's critical to, to keep your mind active. In fact, one of the biggest determinants of the cognitive decline in later in life is people who are active throughout life, yeah. yet they, they um, then retired and then they became, you know, they didn't do much. That led to greater decline than anything else. That's right. A lot of people tend to start having cognitive impairment right after they retire yes. because they're not really challenged um, anymore. Um, and there was a paper about job complexity. Yes how job complexity conferred protection for the brain and uh, prevented from cognitive impairment. Correct. Exciting stuff. It is, it is. Yeah. So, so one of the most important, oh, and if I had, we always talk about, if I had a choice of creating uh, cognitive uh, uh, programs, yeah. one of them would be around music, another would be around art and, and complex activities, and even senior courses. Yes. There are a lot of senior courses, but a lot, aside from senior, it's the earlier you start challenging your brain, the better. Challenging your brain around things you love. Yeah. That's actually what what's, uh, seems to be the, the dominant feature. 
one study we just did that will be published with a great friend of ours who's the main author and we're the last authors um, uh, in charge of the study uh, is uh, with Dale uh, Sherman, yes. uh, neuropsychologist. We did a, one of the hardest kind of studies you can do, a meta-analysis on, on cognitive activities in MCI patients. It was accepted, should be published fairly soon. And we looked at all the data of all the papers that, that looked into this. And again and again, those activities that challenged the mind, uh, especially around your weaknesses. That was a surprise for me. Yeah. Around your weaknesses actually build the brain and protected you. So our advice to you as a family, as an individual is, keep your mind active around activities that you love, around activities that challenge you, and more complex activities. Agreed. Yeah, Agreed. That becomes... And it's different for different people. Yes. So, you know, we all can't do Sudoku, or we can't start working on crossword puzzles. It has to be something that we enjoy. I know you always joke about that, you say you don't like Sudoku. Yes. But so, so I think it's very important, and, and hate that's is the word that I usually use, but that's okay. <laughs> We're not going to use that word today. But, uh, but I think the key part of the message is find something that challenges you on a regular basis, absolutely, no matter what it is, because we are living in an era of personalized medicine, yes. which essentially means that everything that could be protective for you may not work for somebody else. So it's important for us to find out what works for us. My definition of consciousness in the book, I've actually uh, we've alluded to this is. It's islands of consciousness. The first island that we develop and around the age of three where we actually recognize ourselves as separate from the world around us and by some definitions that's called consciousness is, and, and we see this in Alzheimer's, in the last stages the person does not separate themselves from the rest of the world so their anxiety goes away. Yeah. But the islands of consciousness are, the more they're connected, the more they're interrelated, the less likely that they will be severed and you'll lose awareness and, and even the sharpness of, of mentality. Those islands, the more of them you have and the more powerful islands you have, the, the music uh, teacher of 60 years, and uh, you know, that's that person's central island that connects to other islands as well. But if you have no central island, then it's just little floaters of activities of TV shows and you know, uh, little activities here and there, you really have not made those resilient, powerful connections that can protect you. Those powerful, historic, memory-based, emotional, family-based connections that have a bigger meaning, yeah. those are big islands. That's beautiful. Those are yeah. not little islands in the middle of the ocean. That's Australia. You're not going to get rid of Australia. <laughs> it's a continent. It's a continent. So let's connect those islands and, and protect your brain. In our book, we say this in more detail and a, a lot more um, um, a personalized way. Uh, I think that's what makes uh, our book so much more uh, valuable because it, it comes to each person's home. Absolutely. Um, so it, it, it's a fabulous topic. And, um, you know, one of the things as far as um, being functional and applying this concept in our lives is um, our elderly, whether yes. we, it's our parents or grandparents or whoever in our lives that had a very complex life. You know, they were raising kids and working nine to five and taking care of everything and as they grow older because the responsibilities go away and they're not really involved in their daily activities very much suddenly they become very uh, you know they just sit back and they are not challenged on a regular basis and it's very important to uh, find activities that keep them challenged Absolutely. we see that in our patient population almost all the time People in their 60s and 70s that had an incredibly active life suddenly don't have much to do. But, but at the same time, now I'm going to add a little more complexity. Don't throw too complex of an activity or co an activity that they were used to before. If they were a music teacher, yet at, for the last 10 years they have not done much music and there's been a decline, start them slow. Yeah. Uh, one idea about motivation that, that I, I talk about is uh, our mind actually fills in spaces, the empty spaces of our thought. It's like a, that blind spot. There's a blind spot in your vision that your brain actually fills it in. The same thing is with behaviors. Behaviors that become boring, which is too easy, or too hard, too many steps ahead, our mind actually gives, it, gives them a title. I don't like it. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it, it. It's boring. These words that we actually associate with it, but in reality what it was is the activity was too complex. So start with simpler activities yeah. that have success. One patient of mine came back and said, you know, you told me to do these uh, uh, jigsaw puzzles. 
and I've been doing it, but it's just so frustrating. I hate it. I said, can you show it to me? I said, yeah, I have it right here. He brings it to me, and, and the box is a 1,500-piece jigsaw puzzle. I mean, that, that would frustrate me. Oh, and, uh, yeah. So stepwise, slow, incremental, personalized brain activities that challenge and are enjoyable. Absolutely. Something like that you can't write a prescription for. It comes out of the things that other family members see, they recognize, they know. That's where healthcare comes to the home yeah. and you become your own doctor and your family's doctor. Not in pill pushing, we have those as well, but in, in, in how we adjust our life. It's fascinating how much protection it confers to the brain. Correct. Okay, yes. I think uh, we're good for today. Um, if you have any questions, post it um, at the comment section. We would be more than happy to speak with you. And like we always say, if there is any particular subject that you guys are interested in, any questions that you may have, as far as lifestyle is concerned or brain diseases are concerned, bring them on. We would love to speak about it and involve you in it as well. Um, we're away next week to London. We have a couple of uh, exciting things happening. I think we should announce uh, on Monday. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to be on uh, Dr. Oz. Uh, well, the, video, the taping will be then. But then uh, we'll be on BBC Breakfast and several shows in London and uh, we're excited about this uh, like i said all the profits from the book and everything we uh, a lot of what we do goes back to the communities and if you want us to come to your communities yes please ask us uh, we're, we would be more than happy to come and and do uh, seminars as well as workshops Brain workshops conversations uh, group meetings whatever whatever disperses the message faster Right. Um, don't forget to check out our book, um, The Alzheimer's Solution, uh, available on Amazon and uh, for our audience in UK. And the Commonwealth. Have, and the Commonwealth. <laughs> we have our book that was published on October 5th. We're very excited about working with our phenomenal publishing team at Simon & Schuster and Harper One, of course. They're, they've become more, more like a family to yeah. us now. So we're very, very happy uh, with, uh, with everything that's going on and with this general response that we're getting from everybody. Thank you so much for your love and support. And we will see you in two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. Have a great day. Thank you.